does come back. Uh, he messaged me this week and asked me if I, would, if I could preach uh, this Sunday and then next Sunday as well. And so I thought to myself, why not take the opportunity to do a two-part series? Just like a, a bit of a mini-series. Um, so I, I thought to myself, yeah, why not? Let's, let's do that. So what I want to be lo- talking about over the next couple of weeks is the importance of prayer. Prayer as a very significant thing in the Christian life. And I want to focus on two particular things. And that is, number one, prayer in spiritual warfare. And number two, prayer in revival. So what I want to talk about today is prayer in in spiritual warfare. So if you want to turn with me, of course, to Ephesians chapter 6, none other than the spiritual warfare passage. And we'll be looking at that today, concentrating on prayer. There's a battle going on right now that implicates both you and me. And it's a matter of life and death if we fail. If we do not succeed, it's a matter of life and death, not only to ourselves, but to those around us. There's a genuine power struggle happening right now between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Right this very moment. There are angels and demons wrestling and fighting for power. This, this territorial divide. And the general of the army ranks, the president of the kingdom of darkness, the arch enemy and nemesis of your soul, Satan himself, will stop at nothing, nothing to devour you. Are you prepared and are you ready for spiritual warfare? I have three points this morning. In order for us to be successful in our spiritual warfare, number one, we have to know the greatness of our enemy. Know the greatness of our enemy. In this point, I'm going to explore how great Satan really is and how great his kingdom of darkness really is. Number two, we have to know the weapons of our warfare. In this point, I'm going to talk about the significance and the pivotal role that prayer plays in spiritual warfare. And number three, we have to know, we have to really, really know the sacrifice that's required for the battle. And in this point, I'm going to talk about what it costs to engage in spiritual warfare against Satan and his hordes as Christians, as children of the light. So let's read together from Ephesians chapter 6. We're reading from verse 10 to verse 20. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith which it, um, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Here's the key. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for the saints. Pray also for me, that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. The first point today is knowing the greatness of our enemy. And I want to emphasize Paul's words to the Ephesian church when he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle and fight and grapple with human beings. 
Our fight is against the spirits of the dark realm. Our fight is against Satan and his hordes and, and his minions. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. There is a power struggle going on right this very moment between light and darkness. And Satan and his minions and his hordes are, are actually clashing against Jesus and his angels. And that's why Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But we as Christians can fall into this trap of wrestling against fresh, flesh and blood. How many Christians have fallen into this, into this pitfall of thinking that they're fighting against Muslims? Muslims are our enemy. Socialists are our enemy. How many Christians fall into this trap of thinking that, that our kingdom is a physical one? We think that Palestine is our enemy. Friends, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our enemy is not social structures, political campaigns, religious systems. Our enemy is Satan. And we must know the greatness of this enemy. Because if we get distracted with the wrong enemy, then it may not only cost our own lives, but it may also cost the lives of those around us. We have to know who our enemy is and how great this enemy is. We should not have small thoughts of Satan. Insignificant thoughts of Satan. Doesn't mean he's, he's to be feared. If we're in Christ, there's no reason to fear Satan. But he's also not insignificant. He's also not small. He is a great and grand foe, and he is far more powerful than you and I. He's been living for longer than us. Far smarter, far stronger, far, far, far more resourceful than each of us. This is a formidable foe who is incredibly powerful. And we should not fear him, but sometimes we don't fear him, but we actually underestimate our enemy. That's why Paul says we're not unaware of his schemes. We know his power. We know his cunning intelligence. We know his, his wisdom. We know his strength. We know his resourcefulness. And we know that he will stop at nothing to destroy us. Satan has the power to do many things. He has the power to influence people to sin. He has the power to go into people and force them to do grotesque things. He has the power to, to infiltrate churches and, and cause them to be powerless. Satan has the power to cause sickness and disease and even sometimes take life as we just, we just read in Job. He has the power to cause havoc and, and chaos. He has the power to enslave people to their sin under his tyranny and to blind them to the beauty and glory of Jesus Christ. Satan has one goal, and that goal is to distort God's glory. And he will stop at nothing. He will do whatever he possibly can to meet that objective. And he does this all while standing behind the shadows like a coward. And all the while, we as Christians flatter ourselves and think that we're actually kicking goals for the kingdom of God. This is his great deceit. He convinces us not only that he's not that powerful, but that we actually are. We've hardly pushed the enemy back an inch. You think about Acts and what they were able to achieve. You think about church history and the revivals that we've seen under the, the revivalists and the, the preachers and the evangelists and the pastors. And you think about where we are now. We have hardly pushed the kingdom of darkness back an inch. In the satanic army, there are different Ranks. We have to know the greatness of our enemy. There are different ranks. I mean, there are demons, and then there are demons. There are different principalities, different levels of power in the kingdom of darkness, different ranking demons. 
each with a different level, each with a different mandate, each with a different uh, uh, errand coming directly from the general, Satan himself. And we fight against these rulers. We fight against these principalities. We fight against these cosmic powers of darkness, against this evil, against these spiritual forces. We must know the greatness of our enemy because if we do not, then we will surely fail. We're bound to fail. We must, at the very least, be aware of the greatness of our enemy. Being aware is the first step. We've already gone a long way if we're just aware of the reality of the spiritual darkness that is at play right this very moment. This is no child's play, friends. This is no joke. This is more serious and more dangerous than 18 million people dead in the First World War. This is more serious and more dangerous than 85 million people dead in the Second World War. More serious and more dangerous than all of the wars of the history of the world put together. This is a fight for the souls of people for eternity. We must know the weapons of our, we must know the greatness of our enemy. Because if we do not, we will fail. We have a ferocious foe, and he will use everything at his disposal to see us destroyed. And I want to kind of just go on a little bit of a tangent here for just one second. Before I continue and we look at the next point, which is knowing the weapons of our warfare. And I want to state in this very moment that, that there are people, there may be people here, who don't actually trust in Jesus Christ right now. Like you don't know Jesus, or maybe you claim to know Jesus, but, but your life doesn't really reflect the lifestyle we see biblically of what a Christian's life should look like. Maybe you profess Jesus from your mouth, but, but you haven't truly been converted. Maybe you say you're a Christian, you go to church, you've, you've been going to church your whole life, but there's no real life change. You're unmoved by the gospel. You're unchanged by the power of Jesus Christ. You're still uh, uh, stuck in your sin. If that's the case, then you've got this really strange relationship with Satan. Because not only is he your enemy, but he's also your father. You're a part of the kingdom of darkness, whether you confess it or not, whether you realize it or not. In the very same book, Ephesians chapter 2, it says that we once were, meaning those who are outside of Christ are currently following the prince of the power of the air. You guessed it, Satan himself. Children of wrath, following the sons of disobedience. Friend, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, Satan is not only your enemy, but you also pertain to his family. Whether you know it, whether you realize it, whether you confess it or not. And I'm here to plead with you. I'm, I'm here to plead with you to be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the light by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because it is Jesus Christ, as it says in Colossians, who put the kingdom of darkness to open shame as he died on the cross, dealt with sin once and for all. Sin was paid for fully and finally on the cross. This God-man, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life, died on the cross, raised from the dead, is the one who can save us from Satan and his tyranny. And I'm here to plead with you to turn from this tyranny, to turn from your sin, to turn from the darkness that you've been living in and trust in Jesus Christ. We must know the greatness of our enemy. But it's not enough just to know the greatness of our enemy. Being aware is the first step, but it's much more than that. It's not less than that, but it's, it's far greater, it's far more than that. Because we must not only know the greatness of our enemy, but we must also know the weapons of our warfare. If there's a soldier who's out in the battlefield without a bazooka and a handgun, he's going to die. If there's an army that, that 
is going to wage war against their enemy and doesn't have weapons for the warfare is bound to fail. Yes, it is good to know the greatness of your enemy, but if you don't wield the weapons of your warfare, then you will inevitably fail. So let's look again at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, and look at the weapons of our warfare. For this reason, take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having prepared everything, to take your stand. Stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith which, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request. So Paul is being very clear here. He commands the Ephesian church to put on the whole armor of God, the helmet, the breastplate, the belt, the shoes, the shield, the sword, put on the entire army of uh, the entire armor of God. Now, believe me, those pieces of the armor are incredibly important. Incredibly important. If we do not put on these pieces of the armor, then we will fail. But I'm not here to give you a summary of each piece of the armor. I'm here to explain to you the pivotal role that prayer has. Because if we put on all these pieces of the armor, but are prayerless, then we will fail. Prayer is what all the pieces of the armor depend upon. Prayer is the one thing that makes them effective. Which means that if we don't pray, then it's as though our armor is a decorative piece. It's as though our armor is as thin as paper. What's the point of having a paper-thin shield? Prayer is the one thing that causes the armor of God to be successful. The helmet won't work. The shield won't work. The breastplate won't work. The sword won't work. The belt and the, and the, and the shoes won't work unless we are prayerful. It's like a, a fridge that's unplugged or a car without fuel. Prayer is the electricity and the fuel without which nothing will be effective. We can do all the right things. We can say all the right things. But if we are not prayerful, then all those right things will be worth nothing, will be vain, will be empty. When we talk about prayer in spiritual warfare, as the weapon with which we stab the enemy, we're talking about power. This is real power, friends. I'm not now talking about the kind of power that we need to advance and, and elevate in the business world. I'm not talking about the kind of power that we wield when we're, we're, we're a president or a prime minister. The, the kind of power that we use for self-aggrandizement. I'm not talking about that kind of power. I'm talking about the kind of power that we need to defend against Satan and to defeat Satan. The kind of power that we need as a shield and the kind of power that we need as a sword. We need power to defeat Satan because he is far more powerful than all of us put together. Which means that we need to actually draw power from God's fountain. That's what prayer is. Prayer is us drawing power from the fountain of God in the assistance of the spiritual warfare. As the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light clash against one another, as Satan and his hordes attempt to actually destroy us, we need to be drawing from the infinite resource of power that God has so that not only we'll be defended, but that we'll be 
in the offense. Think about the verse that, that the words that Jesus said. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So many times we think of this verse as though we're on the defense. We think as though Satan is the one attacking and we're the one defending. That's not what the verse is saying. The verse is saying that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. It's not our gates, it's hell's gates. We're in the offense and they will not prevail. Prayer is the power we need to destroy and to plunder the kingdom of darkness. And we forfeit prayer. We don't just forfeit the mumbling of words. We don't just forfeit time with God. We forfeit power. 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 Power to defend ourselves from Satan. Power to be offensive against Satan. We forfeit power. If we are prayerless, we are defenseless. It's as though we're asking Satan to come and ravage us. It's as though we're standing out in no man's land and asking for the enemy to shoot us. When we're prayerless, we're completely vulnerable to Satan and his attacks. It was Pastor Tinas from Hope Reformed Baptist who once said that lack of prayer is not only, not, doesn't only result in, in losing the battle, it is losing the battle. If we are prayerless, we are powerless. But Satan, when he sees a Christian praying on their knees, he shakes, he trembles. He is filled with so much fear because he knows, he knows that that man or that woman who is on their knees praying is not powerful in and of themselves, but is drawing from God's infinite fountain of power. Satan trembles, friends, and, and mark my words, mark my words. Satan's kryptonite is a prayerful Christian. Know the weapon of your warfare. When you don't pray, you're like a soldier who keeps his sword unsheathed. When you don't pray, you're like a soldier who's slashing and stabbing and slicing at the wind to no avail, to no real benefit, to no effect. When you're a prayerless soldier, it's as though you're, you're standing out in no man's land with no armor to protect you. Why is it that you make such little progress in your Christian walk and journey? Prayerlessness. Why is it that, that you make such little, little progress in, in your fight against Satan? Prayerlessness. Why is it that you make such little progress in your fight against sin? Prayerlessness. Why is it that you feel like souls aren't being saved and added to the kingdom? Prayerlessness. We have made hardly a dent in the kingdom of darkness because of prayerlessness. Are you a prayerless Christian? Because if you are a prayerless Christian, then make no doubt about it, you are, you are a powerless Christian. You are asking Satan to come and ravage you. You are totally vulnerable to his attacks totally susceptible to his blows. Your sword is unsheathed, your armor is paper thin, and you're slashing and stabbing at the wind to no effect. If you are a prayerless Christian, friends, you are a powerless Christian. The armor of God is not just designed to be a decorative piece. The armor of God is designed to be powerful and effective. But it will only be powerful and effective if you are praying. Prayer is what it all hinges on. You must know the weapon of your warfare and you must wield that weapon. 
know the greatness of your enemy, know the weapons of your warfare, and lastly, know the sacrifice of the battle. Knowing the sacrifice of your battle, and to that I want to point us to to verse 18, those, verse, those, those few words towards the back end of verse 18, where Paul says, and stay alert with all perseverance. Pretty simple. Paul tells the Ephesian church to stay alert, to be watchful, to be awake, to be sleepless, Reminds me of Jesus' words in the Garden of Gethsemane to Peter, James, and John. Watch and pray. Sometimes I wonder what would have happened if Peter, James, and John had been praying and not sleeping. I wonder if Peter would have denied Jesus three times if he was praying. I wonder if James and John would have abandoned Jesus if they had been praying. Paul makes it very clear. Stay alert with all perseverance. I want to make this really clear that prayer is always accompanied with two friends, alertness and perseverance. He's never alone. He's always got this byproduct of of alertness, of, of watchfulness and perseverance, persistence. The Christian's duty is to stay awake and to persevere, to be aware. And here's why. Here's why. Because spiritual warfare is perpetual, 24-7 battle. It doesn't cease. It doesn't end. It doesn't stop. It continues and continues and continues. And even when you're sleeping... Satan and his hordes and his minions don't take the day off and don't start sleeping themselves. They are working behind the scenes. This is the sacrifice, friends. The sacrifice of the battle that Paul and Jesus, the apostles, the Bible, calls us to sleepless alertness. Sleepless alertness. The second a person lays down their burdens on Jesus and is saved, that very same second, they're picking up the sword and engaging in warfare in the battle. We're called to keep watch. And this is the cost. This is the cost. That it's going to cost us our very lives, our comfort, our energy, our time, our resources. It doesn't mean that we we crouch in in the corner of the room and and get in the fetal position and and start to to pray under our breaths as though we're fearful of Satan. It, It doesn't mean that at all. It just means that we don't ever allow ourselves to fall into a complacent mindset. Complacency. Since Satan's fall, he's never, ever taken a day off. Ever. I want you to think about that. Day after day, year after year, decade and century and millennia after millennia, he has not taken one day off. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. He never rests. He is engaging in this battle and in this warfare 24-7. Scheming and planning and fighting. And we're more attracted to sleeping than we are to battle. We're more attracted to luxury and comfort than we are to battle. But we need to be aware that if that's the case for us, then then we've already failed. Never should we imagine that we can afford to take a day off, a sickie, a holiday from spiritual warfare. Never. We cease and we stop when we die. It's not a comfortable path. It's not a relaxing path. It's not a luxurious path. It's not an easy path. Spiritual warfare demands our entire energy. And guess what? 
we don't get, get, we don't get days off. In fact, we can't even afford to take a moment off the ball. Because the second that we take a moment off the ball, Satan will pounce. Of course, it doesn't mean that we literally remain sleepless for our entire lives. It's not at all what I'm saying. Sometimes we need to rest. And of the many reasons as to why we need to rest, one of them is that we need to recuperate and rejuvenate our forces to get back into the battle. How much more effective are we when, the, when we've been rested? You know, I was, I was sitting here just before and, and I had this, uh, this microphone system, this piece that, that is in the back of my pocket and I turned it on and I, I noticed that the batteries were, were just two, there were two bars on the battery. And it made me wonder, I thought about it, that if it's not being recharged before I come and preach, then I'm going to have to use the microphone. The battery needs to be recharged in order to be effective. It's the same with you and I. Sometimes we need to rest, we need to recuperate and rejuvenate our energies in order to be more effective. But we can't stop in rejuvenation. We can't stop at leisure. We can't stop at rest. It's designed to make us more effective in the battle. Spiritual warfare requires the investment of our entire lives. All of our time all of our energy, all of our resources. We never stop. And this is what it requires to engage in this battle. It will require more focus than a sniper attacking the enemy in battle. It will require more grit than the special forces behind enemy lines. It will require more strategy than the Second World War. Paul knew the sacrifice of the battle as he writes Ephesians. King David knew the sacrifice of the battle as he writes the Psalms. Jesus Christ knew the sacrifice of the battle as he would would often retreat to the mountains and pray. Do you know the sacrifice required for this battle of our souls? Do you know and do you understand that Satan doesn't take days off and he is dead set against you with a bloodthirsty hatred? Are you willing to lay your life down and sacrifice for this battle? This is a call to arms. This is a trumpet call for all of us, for you, not to be idle. You must not only know the sacrifice of the battle, but you must be willing to sacrifice for the battle. And if you're not willing, friend, then you can know the greatness of your enemy and you can know the weapons of your warfare, but you will still fail. Sleepless alertness is what is required to repel the kingdom of darkness. Do not fall into lethargy. Do not fall into comfort. Don't allow yourself to, to fall into complacency. Satan never takes days off. Christianity is perpetual 24-7 warfare. Your aim is to destroy Satan's reign, to destroy Satan's kingdom, to take this task with both of your hands, to run headlong into the battle and know that your God will defend you. If you feel like this is weighty stuff, this is a burden that's far beyond you, then I have news for you. It is. This is far beyond your capacity, far beyond your ability. It is. But here's the encouragement, here's the comfort, that God has never given a command that he doesn't empower us to achieve. The God who has saved us will now give us the power to defend us against Satan and his hordes. This is an incredible encouragement for us. This is is such a comfort for us that it's not my power, my strength, my ability, Look at the very first verse of Ephesians chapter 6 and look at the promise. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and His vast vast strength. You're drawing power not from yourself because if it was up to you, Satan will have have a field day with you. But it's not up to you. 
God is commanding us to lay down our lives, to sacrifice for the battle. But know that when when God commands us to do something, He also empowers us to do it. And if you understand that, then you will constantly, constantly be drawing from God's power, constantly be praying, and you will see, you will see the kingdom of darkness being plundered and destroyed. So in conclusion, I just want to remind you once again of those three points. We must know the greatness, the greatness of our enemy. We must know the weapon of our warfare, which is prayer. And we must know the the sacrifice for the battle. Those are the three ingredients for us to be successful in spiritual warfare. There is a battle going on out there right now. It's a battle for your soul. A battle for the souls of your family, neighbors, friends, family. And if you don't engage in this battle, then we are bound to fail. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word that clearly reveals to us spiritual warfare, the reality of the clash of the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Lord, we know that the general of the army ranks, the president of the kingdom of darkness himself, the arch enemy and nemesis of our souls, Satan, will stop at nothing to devour us. Lord, in order for us to to defend and to attack, we must know the greatness of our enemy and not underestimate him. In order for us to To be successful in spiritual warfare, we must wield the weapon of prayer. Satan cowers, trembles, shakes when he sees a prayerful Christian. And Lord, help us to not only know the sacrifice of the battle, but be willing to sacrifice for the battle. Help us to be Christians who follow Jesus' example as we lay down our lives because this battle will require everything from us. Help us to be sleepless in alertness, to be constantly in vigilance, to always be watchful, consistent in perseverance and persistence, to have this undying, dogged, diehard attitude that says, I will not cave in to Satan's schemes, Satan's strategies, Satan's attacks. And Lord, if there is anyone here who is part of the kingdom of darkness, who is under the tyranny of Satan as as victims, Lord, I pray that you will transfer them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Save their souls. Show them the beauty of Jesus Christ and give them a gift of faith. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the wake-up call of Ephesians 6. And help us, Lord, to be engaging in the battle every single day until our our last breath. We pray these things and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.